Hello everyone. Welcome to Indian Economy by Aman Soni. In today's news are, we will be discussing the important articles related to economy from the Hindu newspaper. The page 1 there is a news about the exports crossing 400 billion dollars. India had previously set a target of 400 billion dollars to be achieved through the export of goods. And this is the first time ever we have achieved the target that we have set for ourselves in terms of export of goods. And this has been achieved through the increase in the shipments of engineering products, apparels, garments and gems and jewelry and petroleum product. For prelims, it is important to note the trend of the exports here. We should know that the trend is not consistent because there is an increase again there is a decrease and again there is an increase so if you get a statement saying that the exports have been consistently increasing over the last three years or four years it is wrong because there is fluctuations there is up and down happening in the editorial page global uncertainties india's growth prospects The article discusses about the various macroeconomic factors that Indian economy is facing now and what should be the way forward. During the COVID year of 2020 and 21, the real GDP of India and the gross value added reduced by almost 6.6 percentage. It fell to minus 6.6 percentage and the GVA fell to minus 4.8 percentage. Recently, the National Statistical Organization came up with second advanced estimates which shows that there is a growth in GDP and GVA by 8.9% and 8.3% respectively. Even though there is an improvement, if you look at the absolute numbers, the real GDP just increased by few mar uh, margin. In 2020-22, it was just 147.7 lakh crore and in 2019 and 20 it was just 1.145.2 lakh crore so there is a slight increase in the absolute number but in per terms of percentage there is a tremendous increase in the previous news source we have discussed that this effect is known as base effect when we are calculating a percentage increase of something because of the lower base in the previous term, the percentage increase in terms of the percentage is higher, even though there is a small absolute increase in the absolute numbers. So the authors say that India, the increase in percentage here, it is because of the high implicit price deflator. GDP deflator is a concept used in order to know the amount of GDP that has been caused by inflation and what is the percentage of GDP increase without the cause of inflation if we remove the gdp price deflative percentage from the current year gdp rate we would get the gdp at the constant market prices the authors go into discussing about the other things that the indian economy is facing for example the main factor is the fall in the rural consumption demand. We have been discussing that very regularly. The growth in the private consumption expenditure and the gross fixed capital expenditure, they have been very low. They have been just 1.2 percentage and 2.6 percentage respectively. This shows that the domestic revival in the demand is very slow. And all those sectors which are contact intensive, like the trade, transport sector, they have not recovered to the level of what they were before the pandemic. So even in the construction sector, the growth is happening. The growth is positive, but there is only a growth of 1.9 percentage. And slowly the base effect on the GDP numbers are reducing as we look at the quarterly numbers. And the authors say that without the base effect, the quarterly growth rate would be averaging around 5%. And the annual growth rate would not be more than 7%. And they say that even this might be difficult to achieve because of the ongoing tension between Russia and Ukraine. Then they discuss about the impact of crude oil prices. 
study by RBS shows that an increase in ten dollars over a crude barrel would almost mean that the real GDP growth would fall by twenty seven basis points and the consumer price index would increase by forty basis point. This is by assuming the average price of a crude barrel at seventy five but currently it had reached one thirty dollars and now it is somewhere around hundred plus dollars. So an additional increase over the average assumed price of 75 to 100 dollar per crude barrel it would mean that the GDP would reduce by almost 0.7 percentage and the inflation would increase by another 1 percentage. That means from the nominal expected GDP of 7 percentage it would come to 6.3 percentage and the inflation which is currently around 5 percentage now will come to 6 percentage in the long term. Very recently we saw how even the inflation crossed the 6 percentage mark limit. So now if you add that 1 percentage to the current 6 percentage it would come to 7 point plus percentage. And if the prices of other commodities get impacted due to the Russia Ukraine conflict that would just mean that the inflation would be more and more. And what are the other challenges that the Indian economy is facing? We had earlier forecasted a nominal GDP rate of 11.1 percentage and we then revised it to 13 percentage. And now assuming a tax buoyancy of 1 percentage it would mean the government's tax revenue would increase. What is tax buoyancy? It is nothing but the increase in the tax revenue of the government because of the increase in the GDP growth by not changing the tax rates. You keep the tax rates constant. When the GDP growth increases, the overall economy increases, the tax base increases because of the increase in the growth and because of which the revenues of the government increases. That is known as tax buoyancy. Without the change in tax rate, because of the increase in GDP, your tax revenues would increase. So the authors are saying that because the nominal GDP is expected to be higher and the tax buoyancy even of assuming one tax buoyancy the government tax revenues would be higher and this would be higher than the budgeted amount of tax revenues. But at the same time there would be increase in expenditure because of the increase in prices of petroleum products, fertilizer subsidies etc. So that the government has to plan properly to keep the physical deficit in check. And there are various other economic challenges. Because of the increase in crude oil prices and the ongoing deficit, the current account deficit would impact it. There is value of rupee getting depreciated because of the outflow of foreign portfolio investments. And there would be supply chain bottlenecks in various sectors which are dependent on heavily on petroleum products like the fertilizer sector, iron and steel, transportation, construction, coal, etc. And Russia has been removed partially from the SWIFT financial payment system. So there would be disruption in the making of payments and receiving payments from Russia through the trade. But one positive thing is our trade exposure to Russia and Ukraine is limited compared to our trade with other nations. And because of increasing foreign portfolio outflows and the US federal government, federal bank meddling with the yield rates, there is outflow of foreign portfolio investments because of which the value of rupee is falling, the value of rupee is depreciating. So the authors finally conclude by saying that in order to check the outflow of rupee, the government has to increase the, the RBI has to increase the interest rates so that the government through the fiscal policy can take care of the increasing consumption demand. On the other side the RBI can increase the interest rate and check the outflow of rupee and control the depreciation of rupee so that both these opposing things on one side which is controlling inflation and other side promoting growth could be done by government and the RBI by facilitating with and coordinating with each other. Authors also discuss about the choices when it comes to the oil marketing and the prices of oil marketing companies. If the oil marketing companies are not going to increase the prices that would mean that the government have to give them more subsidies in future. 
if the central government and state governments try to reduce the excise duty and VAT, that would mean that their tax revenues would get affected. Or if the burden of the increase in crude oil prices is passed on to the end consumer, then it would mean that the private consumption which is already low would get further impacted and the growth would get impacted. So they suggest that the growth has to be revived for that maximum attention has to be given for increasing the consumption growth and reducing the cost of inputs so that if the cost of industrial inputs are low the final cost of the product would be low and the consumption for would be high because the disposable income would be high so the others again end by saying that maintaining growth on one side and controlling inflation on other side both are contradictory in nature but the rbi and government has to coordinate with each other and make sure that growth happens in the economy here in this freeze out editorial it discusses about the recent increase in oil prices by the oil marketing companies and how the prices of oil the petrol and diesel for the retail consumer was freezed from almost november 2021 but now suddenly after the election result in few states suddenly they have been increasing the oil prices so the editorial is saying that even though the oil prices and petroleum prices are deregulated and they are to be fixed by the oil marketing companies based on the 15 days average in the global market it's not been happening indirectly the government is having pressure on the oil marketing companies because it is the major shareholders in few of the oil marketing companies like the indian oil corporation or petroleum etc and when the government companies which are major shareholders in the market if they don't increase the price the private players also would not increase the price because they want to keep their prices competitive so the article is finally end by saying that for the political gains you should not fiddle with the policy rates and other economic factors because it would impact the economy in the longer term here tracking the persistent growth of china it discusses about how china is using artificial intelligence in its manufacturing process even during the pandemic and it is improving its manufacturing sector last year there were trade wars between USA and China and the covid pandemic came and everyone thought that because of the trade wars with uh, USA and the covid pandemic all the manufacturing would be shifted out of the China and it would benefit other countries like India but even in 2021 China's economy grew by 8.1 percentage and China's manufacturing output is just almost 3.8 trillion dollars which is more than the GDP of India and china's gdp is also growing very fast china's industrial production rose by 4.3 percentage in december 2021 its fixed asset investment grew its investment in manufacturing grew by almost 13.5 percentage in 2021 especially in the special purpose machinery and overall retail sales grew by 12.5 percent so here we can see that in spite of the pandemic in spite of the trade wars how all the crucial economic indicators are showing that there is improvement in the manufacturing and growth in china especially the investment in manufacturing the capital investment grew by almost 14 percentage and as we have just discussed because of the geopolitical tensions and the trade wars everyone thought that the factories would be moved out of china and it would be moving to the other locations like india and these countries would get benefited and currently china accounts almost for 30% of global manufacturing which is more than united states japan and germany put together and china is currently the world's biggest exporter accounting for 13% of world's exports the chinese president has a strategy of dual circulation what is dual circulation dual circulation is one is internal circulation other is external circulation under internal circulation this is just like the atmanirbhar concept of india the domestic production has to be increased the domestic distribution consumption has to be supported 
through innovation and upgradation of the economy and if there is surplus production that would be for the exports external circulation so that the dependence on the global trades and global markets would be reduced so china would be a self reliant economy in producing goods and services this is just like the atmanirbhar concept of india and one of the major highlights of this article is how even during the pandemic the china is growing in terms of adopting technology and digitalization into the manufacturing for example if you look at the conventional economic theory which says in order for an economy to grow firstly you need to grow, move from agriculture to manufacturing then as the economy grows you would have to move from manufacturing to service sector but even now the main growth in china is happening because of its manufacturing sector especially because of its skilled workforce and its investment into the raw materials and machineries china is utilizing its manufacturing capability to the optimum level and it is going for advanced manufacturing and higher levels of automation and even in those sectors which require sophistication and reliability in production china is investing heavily into technology and it is going for cost efficiency one of the major factors when it comes to manufacturing is the labor cost and china is trying to reduce on this labor cost by investing heavily into artificial intelligence and linking artificial intelligence to the manufacturing so that the operation cost would come down and the efficiency in manufacturing would increase by doing all this the factories of china are being transformed from sweatshops to top floors of fourth industrial revolution the chinese companies especially the manufacturing units are called by the western world as sweatshop because the workers who work there the amount of work the number of work they do is too high compared to the wages that they are paid on one side they are made to do lots of work but on the other side they are paid very less wages that's why those manufacturing units are called sweat shops because they are living on the sweat of the people toiling there and they are not being properly compensated because of paying very low wages these products are able to be sold at the global market at a competitive rate and now the article says that the manufacturing units and factories are being transformed from sweat shops to the shop floor for fourth industrial revolution because of the heavy digitization and automation that is being happening and the integration with the artificial intelligence very recently china has surpassed usa when it comes to the number of applications filed for artificial intelligence patient patents and the research publications and journal citations regarding the artificial intelligence for example in china when it comes to adoption of technology not only the new markets and startups that are being adopting the new artificial intelligence even the old established players and leaders of the market even they are going for automation and artificial intelligence for example a 30 year old lithium powered warehouse forklift they have been using automation in their warehousing so that the forklift could automatically go to the place take the goods come back and deliver the goods and other bus manufacturers who are almost in the business of more than 50 years they are coming out with mini buses and running mini buses in three cities which are driverless so here we can see that not only the startups which are adopting technology but even the old and established firms they are moving towards the technology and embracing it actively and the increased role of robots and artificial intelligence in manufacturing just increases the design delivery and even marketing capacity of china so that the total cost would be eventually reduced and make the comp products of china competitive currently china has the early mover advantage it is for the other economies to look from the china story and we also have to emulate the same we also should heavily invest on artificial intelligence especially research and development because without research and development the technology would not be there only when the technology is viable and it comes to the market only then people would be ready to adopt it for that we need to heavily invest on research and development in technology this is an old article repeated from the archives but it is important let's go through it 
he talks about how the nutrition rates of people are getting children are getting affected during the covid pandemic during covid pandemic we all know that the schools were closed and the main nutrition facilitator for rural children and vulnerable section in the rural areas is through the mid day meal scheme and the very mid day meal scheme got affected because of the covid pandemic and supply chain disruptions the government was not able to provide food to the children and even when there was a option for providing dry rations instead of the cooked food that is the students were supposed to get all the rations the quota of the rations that they were supposed to receive and the eggs that they were supposed to get but because of the supply chain disruptions even that did not happen and the nutritional status of many children got affected the article discuss about this same thing and it provides solutions for that the state of food security and nutrition in the world 2020 report released by the fao the food and agriculture organization says that almost 369 million million children globally were losing out on the school meals during and majority of them come from india because of the mid day meal scheme in the 2020 global hunger index the place of india was very less india was 94 out of the 107 countries this was even behind countries like pakistan nepal and bangladesh and the global hunger index captures the various indices like undernutrition in the population and wasting wasting is having low weight for the height and stunting stunting is low height for the age and mortality in the children below the 5 years of age so all these three indicators would be captured under the global hunger index and we performed very badly in global hunger index and the article says this is very far from achieving zero hunger and a report by international labor organization and unicef has said that apart from being lacking access to the nutritional security the children are being going out of the school and they may not even return to the school because of the falling incomes the vulnerable section children of especially of the vulnerable section they are forced to go out of the jobs and they are going into the child labor jobs and they may not even return to the schools once the school starts under the mid day meal school guidelines of 2006 in india under a mid day meal a child has to get almost of 450 calories of energy minimum of 12 grams of protein which should also include various micronutrients like iron folic acid vitamin a this is kept so that the nutritional aspect of the children are taken care of and this nutritional need almost meets one third of the nutritional needs of the children in the rural areas especially the children from vulnerable section and in many places the children go on a empty stomach to school because of lack of access to food and the one good meal that they get is because of the mid day meal in the school and because of the covid pandemic this very mid day meal got affected the closure of school happened the hot cooked meal which was supposed to be given to the children for food security was not able to be provided the food security allowance or the dry rations which we discussed which was supposed to be given to them was not provided in a timely manner in many states and the data from the food corporation of india shows that the food allocation under the mid day meal scheme the states which they were supposed to take the offtake reduced the offtake was lower than 22% compared to the previous year of 2019 this means that the 23 states reported a decline in the grain offtake whatever the quota of food grains that they were take from food corporation of india and distribute it under the mid day meal scheme it reduced by almost 22% during the pandemic and even the dry ration supplies was very irregular so lot of children lost access to mid day meal scheme and we just discuss about the international labor organization report and children engaging in labor started happening because of the fall in incomes of the family members many children lost many parents and elders in the family and these children from vulnerable section especially they were forced to go into child labor and they were forced to take up jobs and the article says that ensuring functioning of the mid day meal scheme 
especially during the pandemic period and to meet the nutritional security and food security of the country should be the high priority of the government and the authors provide various innovative strategies to do that during the pandemic the main thing which affected mid day meal scheme was the supply chain disruption because of the lockdowns so they go for having local farmers tie up with the school so that the local farmers would be able to provide cereals vegetables eggs to the school and even the local farmers would get income from the sale of those by doing this we can achieve a local economy which is self sufficient in itself and atmanirbhar portion that is the nutritional self security self sufficiency whatever the nutritional needs of the locality are they would be met by the local farmers farmers through the local produce we have to go for decentralized model for local supply chains so that even when there are lockdowns even then there are logistical issues because of the local supply chains the products could be got to the school very fast and it won't impact the access and there was also a initiative new initiative wherein school nutrition kitchen garden was started so that the fresh vegetables that was needed for the midday meal schemes that had to be grown in the very garden of the school if there is place and a similar concept of the free urban canteens or community kitchens which are functioning for the elderly they have to be emulated and they have to be done even for the mid day meal scheme and locally produced vegetables and fruits should be added to the mid day meal scheme because it would also depend on the food choices of the local community that way more and more children would be happily taking the mid day meal scheme and studies have time and again proved that one of the best ways to get children to school especially in rural areas in india is to timely give the mid day meal scheme through the mid day meal scheme on one side we are meeting the nutritional security on the other side because of the children are coming to school in order to have the food they will come to school there would be enrollment and it would also help in improving the educational outcomes only when the children come to school we can take care of the educational outcome so the mid day meal scheme acts on both fronts it also helps in enrollment and it also helps in meeting the nutritional security and nutritional needs of the country in the business page there are no important articles we just need to read the headlines and need not go through the details again here this article discusses about how the prices of goods and commodities are rising for the retailers because of the russia ukraine conflict we need not go through the details of it these are the articles related to economy today thank you so much